Normally, a CPU executes instructions in order. When the CPU first powers up and, and resets, there's some particular address it goes to, it starts fetching and executing instructions. And maybe there's loops and jumps and things, but you know, it's basically just executing those instructions. But most CPUs also support interrupts. And what that does is when an interrupt occurs, the CPU will stop in the middle of whatever it's doing and go execute some other code uh, somewhere else before picking up where, where it left off. In this video, I'll show you how hardware interrupts actually work on the 6502 processor. And apologies for the interruption, but if you want to follow along with these videos, you can get a kit with all the parts for this little breadboard 6502 computer over at my website, eater.net slash 6502. But anyway, for an interrupt to work, we need two things. One is we need some way of triggering the interrupt, and then we need uh, some code that runs once the interrupt is triggered. So for triggering the interrupt, the 6502's got two ways of doing it. There's uh, pin 4, which is interrupt request, and pin 6, which is non-maskable interrupt. And you can see we've got both of those tied to 5 volts right now, and they're, they're active low. That's what the B means. And so the interrupts are triggered by, uh, by pulling either of these pins low, and there's, there's two different types. There's two types of interrupts. They work a little bit differently, and I'll go into uh, some of the, the differences there here in a minute. But the other piece we need is once uh, that interrupt's triggered, either way, we need some code that runs. And the way that works is actually similar to the way that the processor runs code when it first starts up or when we reset it, which is, if you remember back, uh, you know, the very first video where I started uh, actually running uh, instructions on this processor here, uh, which you can check out right there, we had to configure this reset vector. Uh, so at address FFFC and FFFD in the ROM, we've got the address of the first uh, bit of code to start executing. And that's the, the reset vector. So when the processor first resets after power on, it goes there and it starts executing code. Well, we've got these other two vectors for NMI, non-maskable interrupt, at FFFA, and for interrupt request, IRQ, at FFFE. So we can actually set up addresses at those two locations to tell the processor what code we want to execute when we get uh, those types of interrupts. So to see what that looks like, if we actually look at any of the, the code that I've done for this, um, if we go all the way to the bottom of that code, you'll see this spot here where we have, you know, address FFFC, and then we have a word at that address, which is uh, this, well, it's a label reset, but reset corresponds to the address of the reset label, which if we go back up to the top here, you can see the reset label here is at the top, and this is where, uh, when the processor starts up and resets, this is the code it starts executing. Um, so this is resetting and initializing the display, and then, uh, you know, goes on to, to whatever, whatever else this program does. But if we go back down to the bottom, we can add in addresses for the NMI or the IRQ as well. So instead of saying FFFC, we can say FFFA, and then at address FFFA, that's the address for the uh, NMI vector, right? Address FFFA is for NMI, and then FFFC, so well, A, A, and B is NMI, because it's, it's two bytes, and then FFFC and D is the reset, and then E and F is going to be for the IRQ. So we have the NMI, we have the reset, and then we can have the IRQ here. And so these are our new labels that, that aren't defined anywhere, but I can define them here. So I can say uh, NMI is a label, and I can say IRQ is a label. And so now we kind of filled out this entire table, if you will, of the, the vector locations. We've got the IRQ, we've got the reset, and we've got the non-maskable interrupt. So now when one of these types of interrupts, whether it's the NMI type interrupt or the IRQ type interrupt, when either of those occurs, the processor can, can stop what it's doing or, or be interrupted from what it's doing, if you will, and start executing code up, uh, you know, at, at this label. Then there's a, a special instruction, RTI, which is return from interrupt, that will tell the processor, okay, we're done with this interrupt uh, routine, go back um, and continue where you left off. So we can do that for the NMI, we can do that for the IRQ as well. And so with this, we have the, the sort of interrupt handlers for either of these types of interrupts. So if, if either of those pins go, goes low uh, and, and triggers an interrupt, um, we'll execute this code. It's not really a lot of code yet, but we could, we could put more in here. We could write some more code in here to actually execute. But first, you know, to trigger the interrupt, let's actually hook this up so that we can, um, we can cause an interrupt to happen. Because right now this is just tied high, so we're, we're never going to get an interrupt. But what we can do is we can get rid of that. And instead of, so pin four is, pin four is the IRQ pin, interrupt request. So let's pull that out so that's no longer tied to five volts. And instead what we'll do is we'll add a button down here somewhere that we can use to control what that is. So we'll hook that pin four up to our button. And then I'll connect that same uh, pin through a resistor. This is just a 1K resistor, but anything sort of you know, in that range will be fine. 
uh, we'll connect that to five volts. And so at this point, you know, we're, we're still connected from five volts through a resistor, of course, uh, into pin four. So pin four is still going to be, uh, you know, at a five volt potential. So, so really nothing has changed at this point. Pin four will still be at five volts. We still won't have any interrupts. But what I can do now is connect the other side of this switch to ground. And that way, when we push the button, then we'll have ground connected through the switch. Um, you know, and this ground potential will, will pull this high, or excuse me, pull this low, uh, despite the resistor there. And then that'll pull this, this pin four low and we'll uh, trigger, trigger the interrupt. So now we can trigger the interrupt by pushing that button. But of course, if we look at our interrupt handler for IRQ, it doesn't do anything. So this is not gonna be very interesting yet. And so what I'm gonna do is the interrupt handler, when this IRQ interrupt uh, occurs, the interrupt request, I'm just gonna increment a counter. And so counter is just gonna be a byte in memory. It's gonna increment that. Um, and actually I wanna, uh, I want something bigger than a byte. So, so if we get a lot of interrupts, we can count them all. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll say, uh, if the counter um, doesn't roll over, so branch not equal, so that, that means if the counter doesn't roll over to zero, then I want to I want to exit the interrupt. So I want to branch not equal exit IRQ, and then I'll make exit IRQ a label there that then returns from the interrupt. But if the counter does roll over, so it is equal to zero, uh, then I want to increment the next byte in memory. And then once we increment the next byte in memory, well, then we can, ex then we can uh, exit the, the interrupt uh, handler here. So basically, this is just going to increment a 16-bit or a two-byte counter uh, every time we have an interrupt. So it'll just count the number of interrupts we have. Um, and counter will just be somewhere in memory. Um, so if we go back to the top of our program, we have a few values in memory um, th that were part of the program that I wrote in the last video where we're just converting a, a number from, from binary and printing it on the screen in decimal. And these are just in, in, in RAM at zero to whatever. Uh, so I'll just add that counter to RAM as well. And that'll be at address zero to, uh, let's see, the last thing we had was at zero two zero four, and that was six bytes long. So if we, uh, four plus six is A in hex. So zero two zero A, and that'll be two bytes long. So uh, zero two zero A and zero two zero B will be the location of our, of our counter uh, in RAM. So we've got our counter. And then the program we have is actually already set up to print a number because if you check out my last video, basically what I was doing in that video was taking a number that's in memory and it's just uh, hard coded here as 1729 is just this 16 bit number and printing that onto the, the display in a way that we can see. So instead of this number, if we go back up here where that number is being read, initialize the value of the number to convert. Well, instead of printing the number, we can print our counter. So counter, counter plus one, and then this will print that 16-bit counter to the display. So we've got our interrupt handle that increments the counter, and then we've got this uh, program that prints the value of the counter to the screen so we can see how many interrupts we get. Um, although, if we look at this program, it prints the, the value, and then when it gets to the bottom here, um, as soon as it's done printing, it branches down to this, uh, this infinite loop. It just, uh, we have a loop label and then it just jumps to that loop label. So it just sits in this infinite loop once it's done printing. We don't wanna do that. What we wanna do is when it's done printing, we want it to go back up to the top and print again in case the counter has, has changed because of our interrupt. So let's go up to the top here, well, not that far up. And we actually want to restart our loop here. So once it's done printing, it'll jump back up to this loop It'll reinitialize our message. It'll then load the counter from memory again into value, and then it'll go through the whole rigmarole of, of converting that value into uh, into into a decimal number and, and getting that onto the screen again, and then you know go back back up to the loop again. So that'll that'll just sit in a loop and continually print out that number. Um, although one thing we want to do is maybe once we get into this loop, we want to clear the display each time. Although actually we can do better than clearing the display. Uh, if we clear the display, it'll just kind of flicker because it'll clear and then print and then clear and then print. But if we change this to that, I believe that is the command to tell the LCD to put the cursor back at, at the home. So basically take the cursor and put it back at the top. So instead of clearing the screen and putting the counter on the screen, it'll, it'll put the cursor at the top and overwrite what was there before. So that should uh, cause the screen to flicker a little bit less. So each time through the loop, we'll put the cursor back at the home position of the screen. We will initialize uh, the value to the counter value, and then we'll go through and print the counter. 
Okay, um, I think the only other thing we need to do maybe is initialize the counter to zero before we enter the loop. So we can load a zero into the A register. We can store that to the counter and, and actually store that to both bytes of the counter. So we've got our counter zeroed and then we enter our loop and continually print the counter to the top left of the screen. So the, the program itself is not updating the counter at all. It's just continually printing it. So the only way the counter will actually update is at the very bottom here in our interrupt request handler. So when we get an interrupt request, then we'll increment the counter. And then because we're sitting in that loop continually printing, we should see the counter increment. So let's save that. And I'll assemble it and write it to the EEPROM. All right, and let's uh, put our EEPROM back in the circuit and see if it works. Power it up. Reset, so we've got a zero, and it should be continually just sitting in a loop and printing that zero every time uh, because the counter's not changing. But if we push the button, that should cause an interrupt and we should see the counter increment. So let's give it a try. No, oh, it didn't work. Okay, so it looks like it's not actually incrementing it when we give it the interrupt. So what's going on? Well, if we look at the data sheet, we can see there is actually, if we look in the, what do they call this, the programming model, um, these are the different registers that the uh, processor has, so A register, X, Y, program counter, stack pointer, and so forth. There's also a process status register. And one of the bits in that register is IRQB disable, so interrupt request disable. So the interrupt request can actually be disabled and we might have to enable it in order for it to work. And that actually gives a hint at what the difference between the interrupt request and the non-maskable interrupt might be. So interrupt request is really just a request and the processor may or may not service it right away because it might be disabled. Whereas the non-maskable interrupt, as the name might suggest, uh, maybe can't be disabled that way. So how do we enable that? Well, if we look over at the instruction table, we can see there is an instruction somewhere in here. Here we go, clear interrupt disable bit. So CLI is an instruction that will clear the interrupt disable bit, so that should enable interrupts. So let's add that to our program. So we'll go to the top of our program here, and you know, here we're sort of initializing stack pointer. We'll do clear interrupt disable bit. So we'll add that, save that, reassemble, and rewrite the EEPROM. All right, so let's try this. We've got our EEPROM, whoops, <laughs> get it back in there. Uh -huh. Line up, there we go. Power up, so there we are, we're at zero. So now let's try triggering this interrupt. Oh, there we go, wow, look at that. So we triggered the interrupt and it looks like it incremented 5,631 times. So what's going on with that? Let's reset this and try again. Yeah, 2720. So it looks like it's incrementing our counter more than once. So what's going on? Is it, it's, it seems like perhaps, yeah, the shorter you push the button, the fewer times it increments. So maybe I can try to, 971, oops, 647, that's pretty low. It's actually kind of a fun game to uh, try to see, oh, that's not too good, 870. 177, I think that's pretty good. Kind of a fun game to see how low you can go. But but really what's happening is um, the interrupt handler is being triggered as long as this line is low. So, so the, the number of times that the interrupt handler is being triggered it depends on how long, literally how long I'm pushing that button for. And because we're running this processor at one megahertz, it doesn't take very long to get through that interrupt handler a whole bunch of times in, in even a very short button push like this. But you can see every push it's hitting that interrupt handler a whole bunch of times. So what's up with that? Well, if we take a look at the description of the interrupt request line, it says the interrupt request input signal is used to request uh, to request that an interrupt sequence be initiated. So when that happens, the, uh, the, the program counter and the processor status register are pushed onto the stack and the interrupt uh, disable flag is set. So, okay, so once we enter the interrupt handler, we're not gonna get more interrupts, oh, that's good. But then these values are, re are used to return the processor to its original state prior to the interrupt. So when we're done with the interrupt, we do that return from interrupt. It's going to go back to its prior state, which is, which is sort of what we'd expect. And then it says that the IRQ low level should be held until the interrupt handler clears the interrupt request source. Well, what that's saying is that uh, when we 
trigger the interrupt by, by bringing this pin low, it's saying that our circuit should keep the pin low until whatever condition triggered the circuit, that is like me pushing the button, uh, is cleared by the interrupt handler itself. So our code has to somehow cause me to stop pushing this button. So that's sort of weird. But that's what this is saying. It's saying the interrupt request low level should be held until the interrupt handler, that's our code, clears the interrupt request source. And the reason for that is the idea that a computer might have lots of different things that trigger interrupts. So you might have a keyboard, and when you press a key, it triggers an interrupt. Or you might have um, a, a disk drive, and, and when data is, is fetched and, and the data becomes ready, it triggers the interrupt so that the processor can read the data. Or you might have a network interface, and when a packet comes in, it triggers an interrupt uh, so the, the, the processor can then read that packet. And so you could have lots of different sources triggering interrupts, and the processor has to, in that interrupt handler, the processor has to sort out the source of the interrupt, where the interrupt came from. And with the 6502, the way that that works is that you could have all of these different things sending interrupts into that same interrupt request pin. And as long as, you know, your keyboard key hasn't been read or your network packet hasn't been processed or your hard disk uh, data hasn't been read, then those various different devices would keep that interrupt pin asserted. And it's up to the code in the processor to communicate with the keyboard or communicate with the disk drive or whatever it is to read that data and then tell that keyboard disk drive, whatever it is, uh, okay, I've got your data, you can clear the interrupt. And so you can see a circuit like this really isn't set up to do that. Because we really what we would need is we would need some you know more complicated circuit than just a button like this, uh, so that the processor could you know uh, talk to it over the bus and say, okay, I've I've acknowledged your button press, you you can release the interrupt. Otherwise, as long as this interrupt is held low, the processor is going to sit in that interrupt routine continually servicing interrupts. And in fact, you can see that if we reset this, if I push the button, you don't see it count up to twenty two thirty. You just see it jump to twenty two thirty. And in fact, if I hold this down, you don't see it do anything because it's just sitting in that interrupt routine continually incrementing that counter. And then when I release it, then it goes back to updating the display. It actually is able to execute the rest of the program. So this is maybe kind of an interesting demonstration, but this would definitely not be the way that you would want to uh, have a button trigger an interrupt on the processor. But fortunately, the uh, 6522 interface adapter chip that we've got here uh, does have some of the logic necessary to sort of uh, provide that communication. You know, so you could have the button uh, hooked up to the 6522 and have the 6522 then send an interrupt, uh, you know, hook, hook the 6522 up to that interrupt and have it kind of uh, negotiate that and then the processor can talk to the 6522 and acknowledge that interrupt. Uh, so I'll talk about that actually in a future video. But for now, um, let's uh, actually look at the non-maskable interrupt, because actually if we look at that, we can see it actually behaves a little bit differently than the interrupt request. So here it says a negative transition on the non-maskable interrupt input initiates uh, an interrupt sequence after the current instruction is completed. So since the non-maskable interrupt is an edge-sensitive input, an interrupt will occur if there's a negative transition while servicing a previous interrupt. So that's kind of interesting. So, so to contrast that with the interrupt request, the interrupt request, anytime... <laughs> The interrupt request line here is, is low, so anytime like we're holding this button down, we're going to get an interrupt request. It's just going to just keep firing that interrupt request. Whereas the non-maskable interrupt, it's going to do it just on a negative transition. So, so just when we first push the button, perhaps, uh, we'll get that interrupt request. So let's actually try that. Let's, uh, let's switch this around. So the interrupt, the non-maskable interrupt is on pin. There we go, non-maskable interrupt is on pin six. So let's just move this from pin four to pin six, and so pin six we had uh, tied high, just like we had pin four. So now we'll tie pin four high again, so we don't get any more interrupt requests. And we'll hook our button to pin six, which is the non-maskable interrupt. And of course this isn't gonna do anything. We reset, and that's because we don't have a handler yet for the non-maskable interrupt. But let's do that. So if we go all the way down to the bottom of our program here, here's our IRQ handler, and here's our non-maskable interrupt handler. So our non-maskable interrupt handler is not doing anything, but we could do the same thing. Just copy, we'll have to change our label here so we don't have a duplicate label. So our non-maskable interrupt will be basically be the same thing as our interrupt request. In fact, if we wanted to get fancy, we could just 
do that, have both labels point to the same place. So either interrupt will increment the counter. So I'll save that, assemble it, write it to the EEPROM. So I'll put the EEPROM back in the circuit here. And power up, reset, and we're back at zero. And so now when we push the button, that should trigger the non-maskable interrupt. So the falling edge um, will trigger the interrupt uh, just, just one time on that falling edge. So when I push the button, we get one interrupt because it's only triggering on the falling edge uh, of that. It's not triggering the entire time that the interrupt is asserted. So even if I hold this down, we still just get one interrupt. So basically each time I push the button, I'm getting an interrupt, uh, more or less. Uh, I'm actually getting, sometimes when I push the button, I'll get a couple interrupts because the, the contacts in the button are, um, are bouncing. So you, know, you push the button, it might you know, just briefly bounce and make two contacts, and the uh, CPU would actually pick that up as, as, as two interrupts. So if you really wanted, you know, one uh, interrupt per button push, you might need to do some sort of uh, a debouncing circuit, you know, something like I did for this clock module, which you could check out in, in that video there, uh, where I talk about building a debouncing circuit. But in any event, you might think the NMI is, is a little more tempting to use, right? Because the, the behavior seems a little bit nicer, right? You, you get one interrupt per button push rather than having to, uh, you know, build or, or, or work with some circuitry in, in this interface adapter, uh, like I'm going to talk about in the next video where the, the interrupt gets asserted and then the processor has to clear the interrupt. This seems much cleaner, right? You just have one button push, you get one interrupt. Maybe you need a debounce circuit or something to clean up the, the edges. Uh, but otherwise, it seems like this is this is a better solution, right? But there's a couple drawbacks to the non-maskable interrupt. One is that, well, it's not maskable, which means that the interrupt can come in any time. So if the processor is doing something that's very timing sensitive, with the normal interrupt request, the processor could disable interrupts, do that uh, timing sensitive thing, and then re-enable interrupts and check to see at that point whether there's actually an interrupt asserted and, and handle the interrupt at that point. Whereas the non-maskable interrupt, you know, even if the processor's in the middle of doing something that's that's timing sensitive, that that has you know that has to take a certain amount of time in each instruction, you know, the, the exact execution time of, of, of each instruction is accounted for. And so getting an interrupt in the middle of that would would throw off, you know, that that timing sensitive operation. Another situation might be where the interrupt handler is doing something that conflicts with what your program is doing. So we actually have that example here where our, our interrupt handler is incrementing the first byte of our counter and, and then potentially the second byte of our counter. Well, if we go up to our program here where we're actually reading the counter, you know, here we're reading the first byte of the counter and the second byte of the counter. And it actually could be a problem if the interrupt happens somewhere in the middle here. Like let's say the interrupt happens right here in the middle. So we read the first byte of the counter, then the interrupt happens and changes potentially the first byte and second byte of the counter. Uh, and then we come back from the interrupt and then we take the second byte of the counter and put that into the second byte of value. Well, by the time we're done with this, we could have a situation here where the first byte of, of value is from what the counter was before the interrupt, and the second byte of value is from what uh, the counter was after the interrupt. And so the, the, you know, the two bytes together of value don't actually correspond to any particular value of counter. So we can work around this by uh, disabling interrupts. So set the interrupt disable bit here before we do all this and then clear the interrupt disable bit at the end. So then for these four lines, we know we're not gonna get any interrupts. So if the interrupt happens before this and updates the counter, that's fine. Uh, we'll get you know both bytes of the counter into value, no problem. And if the interrupt happens after this, then obviously fine as well. We'll at least have a valid uh, a value uh, to work with at that point. So, so really in most cases, you wanna use the regular interrupt because you, you have things coming in, a keyboard a press or a network packet or something like that, you have that coming in, you wanted to let the processor know about that so the processor doesn't have to spend cycles polling or checking or whatever to, to, to see if someone pressed a key or whatever. But you also want the processor to be able to, to disable that for short periods of time and, and do more you know, urgent or timing sensitive things. The other idea behind the way that the regular interrupt request works is that if you have multiple sources coming in uh, causing interrupts, any of those sources could bring that interrupt request line low and it'll hold it low until it's cleared. And so the way you that would work is that the processor would see that interrupt, it would go into the interrupt handler, and then it would check each of the potential sources for an interrupt. So you know it'll check like, oh, did you push a button? Or it'll check, you know, did a network packet come in? Or it'll check, you know, did, did something else happen? And then as it checks each of those things, it'll see, oh yeah, there was a button press, and then it'll clear that. And if that was the only thing that caused the interrupt, when it clears that, then the interrupt line would go high again. Whereas, whereas if there were maybe two things that caused interrupts, 
then the processor would have to kind of go back again and check everything and see what else caused, might have caused an interrupt at, at that point. So that's why these two interrupt lines behave differently. Like the interrupt request line is designed in a way that it can be shared by, by many different types of things that could cause interrupts. Whereas the non-maskable interrupt, you don't normally want to use because it will interrupt literally anything, even if you've got some you know, very carefully crafted code that requires specific timing. So why would you want the non-maskable interrupt? Well, one case might be, you know, if your circuit is about to lose power, like, or maybe it actually does lose power, <laughs> there is a split second, perhaps you have a capacitor, maybe a bigger capacitor that can power the circuit for just a split second. You could detect that power loss and use just that little residual amount of charge that's stored in that capacitor to power the processor just a little bit longer and fire that non-maskable interrupt. And the processor could potentially do something um, to react to the fact that it's about to lose power, even though it might only have a few milliseconds left. And so in that case, you really do want it to happen exactly when that interrupt happens. You don't care about anything else. It, it's, it's the highest possible priority that the processor could have. And that's really what the non-maskable interrupt is for. So even though it seems maybe more convenient at first to, to use something like the non-maskable interrupt that's edge triggered and you just get a single interrupt per event that comes in, that maybe seems a little bit more convenient than the regular interrupt request line, which for a very simple circuit like a button or, or something else that just like injects a single pulse and doesn't uh, isn't able to really communicate fully with the processor, you know, there really isn't an easy way to just run the interrupt handler once with that. So the non-maskable interrupt maybe seems a little bit simpler, but it really isn't designed for, for that use case. You know, really, the right way to get this to work so that we get one interrupt per button push um, would be to use this, you know, this interface adapter and have it forward the interrupt and negotiate with the processor so the processor can tell it that it's read the interrupt and then it can clear the interrupt before the, rest, before the interrupt handler completes. And so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next video. And at least in the meantime, I've got kind of a fun game of trying to see uh, how short a button press I can, I can get away with here. So... At least I've got kind of an interesting game. But anyway, while I'm doing this, remember you can get all the parts and kits and everything for this project over at my website, eater.net slash 6502. And as always, I wanna thank my patrons for helping make these videos possible by each providing a small contribution per video. You know, that's really what makes it possible for me to continue making these videos regularly, so thank you.